Well, good morning to James River and to Pastor John and to Buford Road Campus. God is good. And all the time. Boy, if you've been blessed by the Lord's presence in worship, wherever you are today, let's give him a hand, would you? Facebook Live, everywhere. Man, Woo, tremendous worship. Gosh, tremendous. Thank you, thank you. Boy, we're so blessed with all of our gifted musicians and those who just lead us into the presence of the Lord on all our campuses. So thank you, thank you. Well, so it's uh, baseball season. I'm missing uh, Norman Burns because he would be talking a lot about who's going to the playoffs. And I would have been the first one to have shared this story that I came across this week um, about a baseball game that was played between the Lord's team and Satan's team. And it seemed that the Lord's team was up to bat and um, everything was on the line. It was the bottom of the ninth, two outs. Um, nobody's on base and the score is 0-0. I, I mean, this is the game right here. And so the Lord is standing in the dugout with his coach. And, uh, and so the next batter comes up after the first uh, two outs were made. And the name of this batter was Love. And Love got up to hit the ball and hit a line drive and got on base. And we understand why. Because love never fails. That's what the Lord said. Sure enough, the second batter up was Faith. Faith hit another line drive, got on base. So we got somebody on first and second now. Why? Because we know because faith works with love. And then comes the third. Godly wisdom steps up to the plate. Satan reels back and just fires a pitch. Godly wisdom just watches it go by. And again, ball one, and he does it for three more, and so he gets a walk on balls because godly wisdom never swings at anything Satan throws. <laughs> you got to love it, but it ain't over. The game ain't over. Wait for it. The Lord turns to the coach and says, you think that's good. It's time for my star player, Grace. Well, the Lord, uh, the Lord, the coach, the guy who was standing there with the Lord turns and looks at Grace and thinks, well, that doesn't look like much in the back of his mind. He doesn't say that out loud. Grace steps up to the plate and Satan, you can tell there's a grin on his face because he thinks, I, I got this. I'm going to strike him out. This game will be over and we're going to win. So sure enough, he threw the hardest pitch he could ever throw to Grace and Grace hit that ball harder than any ball had ever been hit. Satan gasped for a moment and turned around and thought, no need to worry. I got the best outfielder in all of baseball and sure enough, the outfielder went up and the ball went right past his glove, hit him on the head and bounced over the outfield fence. Grand slam home run. How about a, how about a cheer for the Lord's team? Well, I mean, so I'm reading this story and I said, well, no, no duh, you know the Lord wins, right? But there's this amazing conversation that takes place after the game. The Lord looks at the coach and says, so let me ask you a question. He said, do you know why love and faith and godly wisdom were able to get on base but not win the game? Coach said, well, well, no, I don't know. Tell me. So the Lord looked at him and said, well, you see, if it was your love and your faith and your godly wisdom that won the game, you would think that you did it by yourself. And you see, while love and faith and godly wisdom can get you on base, there's only one thing that will get you home, and that's my grace. That's my grace. Grace. When I begin to try to think about how do you, yeah, you can preach about grace, but there's so much more than, than just like, I mean, there are just some things in life, they're hard to explain, they're hard to articulate, they're hard to wrap concepts around. It doesn't matter how, how much we can articulate or be eloquent in our speech. I mean, for example, if I said to you, so, so tell me what love is. Well, you, so you might begin to throw out words and phrases that describe love. You might even tell me about an experience you've had with love. But I have a question after listening to you. Am I really going to know what love is? Because my guess is after all the talking, we both would arrive at this point where you might say, you know, the honest truth is you're not going to fully understand love until you what? Experience it. There are so many things like that in life. Right? Pictures can't capture it. Words can't capture it. We're not sure how to actually give that gift to someone. So today we start this series about grace. And I, I was, it kind of dawned on me, you know what? Jesus never uses the word. Do you know that? Jesus never uses the word grace. But the Apostle Paul uses it over 100 times. The Bible itself more than 200 times talks about the concept of grace. But what Jesus did do is that he not only showed us what it looked like with his life, he explained it in stories like the one we just finished our series on, The Prodigal Son. 
I mean, if you can't come away with that from an image of this, the father waiting for the son to come home, it didn't matter at that point. All he had done wrong, he was forgiven, and all was made right. It is this imagery of grace. And so we begin to learn from the, the words that we, that we try to describe grace with, some of those images and what God did with his life that God is, well, this grace is God's unmerited favor to us. It's his mercy to us, even though really we're not worthy to receive it. It is God blessing us over and over again, even though we don't deserve it. And so as we begin this journey of grace, I, I, want us, I feel like we need to well begin at the beginning. And our ability to kind of understand and experience grace is in direct correlation to the degree that we would acknowledge we even need it. I want you to hear that again. Our ability to understand and receive and experience grace is in direct correlation to the, um, to the degree to which we would acknowledge that we even need it. Look, we, we know ourselves well. And the fact of the matter is when we've done wrong, when we've, when we've sinned and we're guilty of something that we immediately go to our defaults of minimizing our behavior, defending ourselves, justifying ourselves. And I want to say to you, if we continue to deal with our sin that way, we will never fully appreciate the power of God's grace. Oh, we'll talk about it. We might skim the edges around it. But until we come clean fully, and understand where we are, we cannot fully appreciate the power of God's grace. As I shared with you in the last series of sermons, it can often come out like this. Oh, yes, oh, yeah, I mean, I know I'm a sinner, but I'm not that bad. Hello, anybody home? You ever said that? Ever heard anybody say that? And yet Romans 3.23, we keep being reminded, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And my point is, if we think we're not that bad, then grace will never seem that good. Did you hear that? If we think and operate out of this, this, well, kind of false reality that I'm not that bad, then grace will never really seem that good. If the prodigal son series taught me anything, it was this, that I can kind of tell myself in my head, I, I know I sin, but I, I'm, you know, I'm not that bad. I mean, and we do this all the time, and so we use different methods to kind of well, keep deceive ourselves, really. So how am I not that bad? Well, let's compare ourselves to others, right? I, I mean, we look at our lives and think, well, I may have sinned, but that ain't nothing compared to the guy I work with. Listen up. <laughs> or how about the lady who lives down on the corner there? And we begin in our mind to kind of point, well, really self-righteously and pridefully at others who have sinned, kind of saying, look at their sin, it's bigger than my sin. Well, guess what? The Bible would say that kind of self-righteousness and that kind of pridefulness, those are sins. So even while we're busy comparing ourselves, we're sinning again. And what we're doing is we're depreciating the power of grace when we minimize our sin. When we're not, when we're not honest with ourselves and our heart and soul about the brunt of our own sin, and we're so busy covering it up, we will never fully experience His forgiveness and the power of His grace and the joy that comes with it. You know, when you look back at Scripture, Jesus, it just occurs to me, Jesus really never made anybody feel better about their sin. He didn't make them, He didn't excuse it. He forgave it, but He didn't excuse it. He never gave anybody the message, well, you're not that bad. Right? For example, the woman in Luke 7. She comes to Jesus, whether she recognizes him the Messiah or not, we, we don't know. But she certainly recognizes he's different. He may be the Savior. She falls at his feet. She's sobbing. Her tears cover his feet. She uses her hair to dry his feet and pours perfume on him. Meanwhile, the religious folks, the Pharisees, are standing there pointing, saying, if this man really were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman she is. She's a sinner. Straight out of the words of the good old church going folks. She's a sinner. And Luke 7, 47 gives the response of Jesus when he looks at them and says to her, therefore I tell you, her many sins are forgiven. He called her out. He, he didn't try to make her feel good about what she'd done. He net your, her many sins. Do you hear this? 
He wants her to own this because in order for her to, to receive the fullness of his grace and his power and his forgiveness, she has to own the reality of the depth of her sins. And so he says, she's forgiven of her many sins. Oh, and then he turns around and teaches the Christian folks. The Pharisees, a good little number there. He says, let me just tell you this. Whoever's been forgiven little, loves little. Another way of saying whoever's been forgiven much is able to forgive much. Do you see? She gets it. She's going to recognize the full weight of the grace given to her. And because of that, she then is able to share that grace and experience that grace to other people exponentially because the grace gets multiplied. Can I get an amen? If you got it, you're able to give it. If you ain't got it, you can't give it. That's what this message is about. So when we begin, we've got to own this. I read a quote this week by Pastor Jean LaRue that brought my soul to my knees. I want to quote. If the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. Yeah, that's what I said. If the biggest sinner you know isn't you, then you don't know yourself very well. Well, okay, so I read that and I struggled for a minute in my soul and I said, okay, let's move on. There's, we got, well, surely, let's move on. This has got to get better, right? Grace prevails. Yeah, it's got to get better, right? No, then I run into 1 Timothy 1.15 and this is what Paul says. Paul says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. In other words, hey, y'all, listen up. I'm fixing to tell you something that'll change your life. Here it is. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners. Here it is. Hey, Paul says, of whom I am the worst. He didn't say I was. He said I am. Present tense. Do you hear the difference in that? Now, I, I want to venture a guess this morning. If I, if I came to each one of you and said, so let me ask you, are you the worst sinner you know? I think some of you would say, I beg your pardon. No, I am not. Let me tell you about some people who are worse sinners than me. Or you may say, try to say humbly, well, yeah, yeah, yes, I am. But deep down, we don't really want to own that. And yet Romans 3.23 keeps screaming, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Go back and look at the verse. It doesn't say for all have sinned. There are some that just sin little baby tiny sins. It's little tiny baby. It's okay. It's, gonna be, it's not that bad. It didn't say, well, some sin little tiny sins, but those little tiny sins got a little bigger. It didn't say some of y'all took them tiny sins and they got a little bigger and now you're flat over the top. You're out of control. You took the cake. There's no ranking in Scripture. The truth is we have all sinned and there's no minimizing. You ready for this? What we deserve. According to Scripture, Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death, meaning eternal death separation from God. We, 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 we're not going to get the... We, we won't be able to receive that full measure of grace that saves us, right? Until we receive it fully. Let, let me explain it in this way. For the past 36 years, my wife would tell you, I am the most horrible sick person in the world. That didn't come out right. I'm not like a horrible sick person. I'm, when I'm sick, I'm horrible at being sick. Okay? You, you got that? Well, here's why. Because it all starts with my refusal to say what? I'm sick. It, so you do it too. Yeah, we do. But, but I know I do. And you know why? I don't want to admit I'm sick because then I have to do something about that. I have to change. I, I, gotta, I have to take the medicine. Right? I got I to gotta take the medicine. I got to lay down on the sofa and, and, and let my body catch up with me. But let me tell you something. You know this to be true. The longer I refuse to admit my sickness and take my medicine, the longer it will be until I am cured. Until we come face to face with our terminal diagnosis of sin and the wages of sin are death, we cannot receive the full impact of the cure. The antidote is known as grace. The Bible diagnoses every one of us with this terminal illness. You heard it read this morning, but I want you to hear this again. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. It started with Adam and Eve. But then there's good news coming. Romans 5.12, when Adam sinned, entered the world. Uh, I mean, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone 
sin. So we're diagnosed with this sin and our condition is terminal. So here we are. The sickness has been diagnosed, sin. The prognosis has been announced, death, eternal separation. But guess what? Here's the antidote. It is called grace. And it enters in there in chapter 5. You see what it says. For Adam's sin led to condemnation. But God's free gift, listen to this, God's free gift leads to our being made right with God. Can I get an amen? His grace does that, right? His grace, because it says, but even greater is God's wonderful grace. So here's the good news about the ball game. Grace prevails. Say it with me. Grace prevails. Say it again. Grace prevails. And until we understand that the blood on that cross is the antidote for our sins, for our illness, we can't fully receive it. We, we've got to be in this equation to fully recognize our sin. Not our sin compared to our neighbors. Not our sin rationalized. Not our sin minimized. Not our sin uh, in any of this way. And if we can't get out of the way of that, we'll never receive the full power of grace. Here's the truth of the matter. I am worse than I ever want to admit. But God's grace is greater than I could have ever imagined. And that's the message for today. Grace wins out. Grace prevails. Grace is the only way you and I are going to get home. Pray with me. Well, the truth is, God, we can't really receive the cure until we understand the depth of the diagnosis, the depth of our sin sickness, if you will. So, Father, please give us the courage to be honest with ourselves in these very sacred minutes right here, right now. Help us, O oh God, to open our hearts and our souls to be soul naked before you. Not hiding anymore, not comparing anymore, no minimizing anymore, not blaming anymore. But to understand fully the reality of what we have done to ourselves. God, if there's one listening here right now, your Holy Spirit is convicting them to say, come follow me, come give me your life. I want to forgive you. I died for your sins. Let it happen in this next moment, Father, that they would pray to receive you. But there's a whole bunch of us listening right now, Father. There's a whole bunch of us listening who have, we've tasted grace, but have we truly received it? born out of the honesty with which we come to the foot of the cross before you. To say, I may be, I am the worst sinner I know. But your grace, O oh God, prevails. Cleanse me today. Walk with us in these next few moments, O oh God. Find us faithful as we respond to you and what you've said to each one of us in this hour of worship. Amen and amen.